Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Behind the Seams Podcast. Today we're speaking with Jabin Weaver. I've been calling him Jabin for a while and now I'm glad he corrected me. Jabin Weaver. And he first joined the Villanova coaching staff as a volunteer assistant during the 2019 season. After departing to serve a brief stint as the director of baseball operations at Campbell, Weaver returned as the Wildcats pitching coach for the 2020 campaign and added recruiting coordinator to his duties after the 2022 season. The 2020 Wildcats pitching staff featured six hurlers with an ERA below 3.5 under Weaver's guidance. Wildcats on the 2022 roster alone set their marks as leaders for the program's history. This included Tyre Arella and Devin Rivera, who trains here, both tying for the third most combined career shutouts. On the single season side, Rivera's three combined shutouts in the 2022 campaign tied him for the most in the program history with Chick D. Gaetano, another RPP guy, following closely behind in a tie for fourth most with two. Jabin is in constant contact with me. He's one of the more forward-thinking pitching coaches that we deal with here. Anytime he has questions, he's open to calling. He's open to taking advice. I love having him as somebody that I can bang things off of also, as well as sending his guys here. So today, we're going to welcome to the show Jabin Weaver. Jabin, thanks for being in, man. I, I'm so pumped. I'm so excited. This podcast has is, is done wonders for me. Um, so many awesome guests on this thing, so many great episodes, and I'm super pumped. I'm a Philly guy. You know, Jabin's pitching coach at Villanova. I'm a Philly guy. I grew up in Philly. My daughter just finished college in Philly at Arcadia, and uh, it's a great place to live, you know? You live right outside the city, right? Yeah, yeah. We're up in um, a couple, probably 15, 20 miles outside of the city, up in the suburbs, and then our ballpark is a little bit further, um, and I'm up in Bluebell. So, yeah, it's uh, one of, it is definitely the most passionate area for sports that I've ever been in. And it's not close. It's awesome. Uh, this yeah. This past fall with, with the Eagles success and the Phillies as well at the same time. Uh, wow. Just, it was, it was crazy. It was, it was really cool to, to be a part of and just watch the kids get all excited and it was awesome. What's really amazing is I think we've had like this, this year we've had like four or five of your guys here training in the, either the summer or the winter college throwing program or in the off season. We, I know we've got a, we've got a new guy, Jake Francis coming to you this year, which he was just a hard worker. He's, he's here right now in the gym. So we love the, uh, the camaraderie we have with you guys. Talk to us a little bit how you initially make the transition from playing to coaching. My transition definitely started uh, in high school. Honestly, I had, I started the summers during playing high school. I would coach the younger, like we're talking 14, 13 U Babe Ruth teams up in New York. And it was awesome. It was so much fun. And then when I got to college and I had a summer or two where I was rehabbing and I would take over the local teams again. And then I eventually ended up running a Legion program. I had two teams. I had a 19 U and a 17 U while I was in grad school. Um, I would take classes at West Virginia um, and then in the summertime, the first year I would come back and I had the Legion program um, and it was awesome. It was it was so much fun uh, getting back and, and getting a, to work with the kids that were at my high school and my community. Um, and then in the college ranks, when I went out to West Virginia and started school, basically I just I Googled in GPS schools that I could drive to in the distance. Um, and thankfully, uh, Phil Caruso at Fairmont State had just taken over the job that August and he didn't have a staff yet. Um, so I, I got in touch with him and we went and sat down, had lunch one day and, and he brought me on as an assistant pitching coach. And, and that was the first full year of, of being a college coach division two in the, in the MEC. And it was, it was awesome. It what, was a what, great time it, I learned. What was you, what was the feeling like when you first got to college, like your very first college gig, what was like the aha moments for you when you were like, got there and like, what was so different uh, as to prior coaching younger athletes? Definitely the age because I'm standing there and I'm 22, 23 years old. And, and these guys are, we got some seniors that are 21, 22, 23 years old. <laughs> and it's like, how can I somewhat have a relationship with this guy, prove that I somewhat know what I'm doing. Um, but I'm also 22 years old. So do I, and are they going to figure that out? Um, and just, you know, just learning that process and, and the communication styles between, between that and a, you know, an 18 year old freshman coming in, um, that's definitely the, the toughest like starting point. Yeah. You're um, like one of the that, guys at that point. You're like one of the guys. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And that, that year I learned so much too. And that, that specific job honestly set me up for so much success 
at Villanova because I was an assistant pitching coach, but the, the pitching coach that was there, Trad Sokol, he had come from um, – he played under Phil Caruso, our head coach, and he was drafted, and he had some minor league time under him. And that's really where I learned how to um, work with, coordinate, and be an assistant with another pitching guy and learn that communication style and, and not to step on the toes and, and try to have my impact and my influence, but also like understand my, my, my position and my place. And, and, you know, I'm just trying to benefit and, and help. And that honestly, you know, really set me up for down the road where, uh, you know, now I'm at Villanova and our head coach is, is coach Mole and with his background. And so now we're working together and, you know, that was, that was a really good starting point, but, you know, coach Caruso taught me so much about the lifestyle and how to be a coach and um, really how to deal with the family aspect of that too. Um, and how to handle that and, and be the family guy first. And um, it was, it was a great spot. And then luckily from there, my second year of grad school, I was lucky enough to, uh, to hop on and be a graduate student assistant with coach, with coach Maisie at West Virginia um, awesome. and really get to, yeah, spend some time uh, about a year and a half, really spent some time with some high level baseball. Um, that was, that was an amazing time. A ton of really, really good pitching at the time. Uh, Michael Grove was there. who's pitching with the Dodgers and Alec Manoa was a freshman. And when I was there, he was actually still trying a two way getting wow. ground balls at first base and swinging in the cage. Um, you know, there was so much good pitching there at that time. And, um, that was awesome. That was really, that year was where, okay, I, I, I was set. I was locked in. I said, this is it. This is what I want to do. I want to do it at a high level. Um, and I knew right from there, I'm like, all right, I'm going to do what I need to do to, to make this happen. So coming from out of West Virginia, how did you get to Villanova? Um, my wife and I are from upstate New York. And um, that summer, there was an opening at um, Hudson Valley Community College to take the program over as head coach up in Albany. And um, we were getting married. Uh, we were, you know, we were engaged. Our, our wedding was, you know, about 10 months away. And we just thought what an awesome opportunity to, you know, kind of put head coach on the resume at some level, thought that would be really good experience. And obviously for us to be able to go back home and spend some time, you know, with family, we thought kind of a no brainer. And I went through the process and uh, I went down and I went up and interviewed and um, thankfully had a great relationship with Justin Hoyt, the AD there. And, and he brought me on and, and that was, that was probably the best experience I've had because those kids were amazing. I had so many different backgrounds and, and lifestyles and the Juco route 100% is the Juco route. Um, those kids are special and, you know, they're, um, they're just amazing human beings and come from different backgrounds. And, um, but man, they were talented and I had some awesome kids and, uh, they were grinders and, you know, we went through some things, we had some experiences and, um, it was awesome. We had, I was there for a year and a half and, you know, we won 30 games and, and, you know, swept the sub regional and went to a regional final and it was great. And I got kids all over. Now we had kids that from that roster playing for Lemoyne and had a center fielder that went down and played FAU. And I got a guy that's coaching division one and already young in his career. So uh, it was awesome. Yeah. Those upstate guys are like, you know, you got some farmers kids up there. They're, 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 they're rough, they're rough and ready to go, you know? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. But then we're also got some Troy and Albany kids too. So the mix on the roster was, was really, really diverse. Yeah. Uh, but that, that just made it, you know, that just made it all the better. And, and then brought... from there, yeah, yeah. from there, I, I was a pitching coach in the, uh, the perfect game one summer and I had two Villanova guys on the roster. Um, and that winter, uh, the volunteer position opened up and was talking to those guys about it. And, you know, I said, this, this might be something, this might, might be the way into division one. So took our shot and we went down an interview with, with coach mold. And, um, and, you know, from, from there we came down and became the volunteer and, and took over the catchers and yeah, it was, it was great. It was awesome. And, um, went down to Campbell because my wife got a job down there and said, all right, let's, let's go. Cause ultimately wife's got to be happy. She is, she is the all-star. She's the stud. Um, so that was awesome for her. We went down to Campbell the following summer and, um, and what an experience that is because, you know, you get to work for Justin Hare, it's a different breed. That's a, you know, he's one of the best human beings, um, you know, in that program, just to, to see how that's run and, and what they do on a daily basis and what the coaches do, 
how they conduct themselves. Um, that was really cool. That was an awesome experience. Um, and then that winter of 2019, that December, um, the pitching coach at Villanova had, had, you know, decided to go do something else. And I called up probably immediately and said, Hey, is this a possibility? You know, is there interest? Cause I think we would come back up. Um, and you know, a couple conversations, a couple phone calls, sat down at the dinner table with the wife and that was the decision that was made. We came back up and, um, you know, we've, we've been loving it ever since up here on awesome. the mainline. That's awesome. How have you, uh, how have you seen things change over the years, uh, you know, recruiting wise and the type of athletes that are coming in? What are some, what are some big changes that you've noticed over the, over the years? I would say probably the type of games that they're playing in the summertime. Um, when I was really, really early in the process and even in college, those summer games were a little bit more um, league and, and tournament style where kids are still like starting pitchers. If you got a starting pitcher, those kids are still, they're going 100, 110 pitches. And, you know, there's things that are being done. Um, it's on the offensive side as far as moving runners and, and bunting and, there's a little bit more of that because the showcase style of the game wasn't quite there yet. Um, and then now it's, you know, now it's pitchers two to three innings, they're done 40, 50 pitches, another pitcher rolls in, um, you know, and there's so many different events where, uh, you know, we're rolling innings and we're pinch running for the catchers and pitchers and there's certain stuff like that. So I think when the kids are coming in, at least on the mound side, Physicality wise, most of them are right around the same of what I would think they would used to be. Um, but they're still a little bit metric heavy on what is important to them. And the adjustment of pitching in the game and winning the baseball game and how to actually get out as opposed to what do my pitches do? What do they look like? How hard am I throwing? Um, now it's become – uh, the biggest thing freshmen is holding runners like coming in and all of a sudden it's like, okay, you know, we got to be one, three or under, and we have to do this with the looks and this with the holds and, you know, certain, like how to manage the game, how to manage a lineup. Um, I think that more work needs to be done in the fall with incoming guys than, than it used to. Really? That's, that's, that's really interesting. And you think it's because of the lack of innings that they get before they come there. Just I I think just different. Like they're 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 doing that stuff in high school, but even in the Northeast, like they're not playing a ton of high school games, right? They're not getting fifteen to twenty starts in the high school season, um, you know. And then, um, you know, in the summertime, you know, we're trying we're trying to make ourselves attractive for college coaches, and we're trying to make sure that we're strong and our and our velo is good and our breaking ball is good. Um, but how many, you know. Like for the fall, for example, they get into the fall. How many hours in the fall are our teams working on the bunties and the first and thirds and doing that stuff defensively? Um, you know, that that becomes a shock, too, I feel like, to some new guys is how important that is even in the fall. Um, so do you, do, you know. so this brings me right to my question. Do you find that most guys, freshmen struggle in year one due to not being adjusted to a higher volume of throwing um, and you mix in campus life? And if so, how do you deal with this common problem with the guys? It's, it definitely can be a struggle, um, especially the, the, the throwing volume, just because of like the practice setting. Uh, yes, there's, we have to make sure that we're doing what we need to do for our arm and for our development. But then there is other stuff we need to take care of. Like we need to make sure that there's a day throughout the week where you're working on pickoffs. Um, there's a day throughout the week where you need to be fielding bunts and throwing them to bases. And this right? is volume, you know, this is all volume. And this is all volume. It's all volume. Um, that definitely is is a shock for sure. Um, you know, so for for us, and I'm sure for a ton of people, it's the communication as soon as we can, as early as we can start the communication. Um, you know, there, there's high school seasons over and the summer starts it's communication as much as we can. And then it's, you know, planning out the summer, what they do, how do they do it? And just making sure that I can tell them as much as I can, what they need to be prepared for and what they need to expect when they get here. Um, you know, especially for a program like us, because we get a ton of freshmen that pitch right away. Um, so 
those guys in the fall, right away we hit the ground running and they need to be able to handle that so we can work on the picks, um, the first and thirds and the bunts and know where we're throwing the baseball. Um, you know, so it definitely, though, the throwing volume and, and just practicing every single day. Because especially at least in the summertime, they're not used to that because they're maybe getting a bullpen or something throughout the week, maybe once or twice, and then they're going playing on the weekend. You know, it's and, not. And they're also trying to they're also trying to acclimate to living in a dorm, and and uh, absolutely none of their friends that they grew up with their entire life are around them. There's a whole new set of parameters, and I and I honestly I see that. Um, I can imagine what you see because I even get that from the parents calling me up. When a kid commits to a school, uh, I get calls from the parents. Um, Nunzio, oh my, like, like I don't know. We 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 really know he needs to work out this this summer, but um, you know, they sent him a program, and I'm like, listen, I'll talk to the coach. Well, they, you know, they don't realize that you have. That's something that you have to do because not everybody has a place in a private sector like this to train. And there's all kinds of nerves coming up from parents. I think the parents get more nervous about it sometimes than the kids do. And that transcends into the kid a lot of times. So my message to that is like, you know, I think I think a lot of times parents need to try to like, you know, be a little more calm and let the kid understand that everything's going to be OK, because they seem to be when they talk to me, they seem to be more nervous about their kid going to school than the kid is. Yeah. Oh, for making sure. The, making the, the coach happy. Yeah. I mean, the kid, the kid's riding high, like he's going into the best experience of his life. We hope, you know, so, but they're not also thinking about that, that other half of that lifestyle because you got the baseball, but then it's all the other stuff that, that goes into it. And exactly. All the laundry and the schoolwork <laughs> where no one's really telling you to do it. So does it get done or not? And the amount of mm -hmm. the amount of extracurricular activities <laughs> like parties and stuff that are happening that aren't generally happening when you're living at home with your parents. Yeah. Yeah. That taxes absolutely. the net central nervous system like crazy. You know, you get kids, they gotta be durable. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and it's it's time management, honestly. Definitely. Um, it's time management, and it's and it's being able to say no when it's needed. Right. Absolutely. It doesn't need to be all the time. We get that. We're not naive to that. And it builds um, character, too. So not for nothing. You got at some point you got to start being a man. Right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So what are your thoughts on the decreasing usage of fastballs? I mean, guys are throwing harder every year. Guys are throwing harder. They're getting stronger. We know a lot more about how to train velocity. Um, but we see them. We see fastball usage going down. What, what are your thoughts on this topic? And, you know, what do you what do you how do you account for this? I love this topic because I love the place where we will go up against some really, really good offenses and we need to figure out how to beat those offenses and, and contain them as much as we can. And this is 100% and one of the biggest avenues to help with that. Um, you know, the biggest thing I've learned, especially this year is the decrease in fastball usage, honestly, in my opinion has worked better for the guys that have better fastball command because we're throwing less of them. But then when we do, do, yeah, then they look even better, especially the guys that have the metrics along with it. But if we're, especially inside, like inside and up, if we're, if we're dotting those after not throwing a ton of them, now it's even tougher to hit. Right. Or even like the guy with the run, we go back door at times um, like that. That just makes it so much harder to hit. In my opinion, though, if the guys don't have that location and they don't have the command of that, then it's still tricky because when we do throw it, then, it, you know, if it's if it's a lot of plate, then it, no matter how many of them you're throwing, they're still going to be damage done. You know, so um, the command for me on both sides needs to be there, especially if you're going to throw a lot of off speed because of the off speed. If you don't have the command of it, and then all of a sudden now we're in fastball counts a lot, and then we also are catching a lot of middle, a lot of plate with the fastball, you're just asking for trouble. Right. You're asking for trouble. Um, and then also, too, I think it changes on the role. Um, I think starters, for the most part, at least beginning of the game, try to get in a role a little bit and try to get some confidence and start dotting the fastballs. And then if you want to change from there, you can, depending on the guy. Um, but so much of what I do and so much of what we do is, is dependent on the guy. 
you know, so we're going to have fastball guys where, where we're going to throw a ton of them. Right. Right. And, you know, and, or we're going to have the guys that we don't, um, but ultimately either way, I don't think it matters more than uh, putting the pitches that you have where you want to, when you want to. It's like That's chess. Gonna set you up no matter where. It's yes. like playing a game of chess, man. You know, you can't, you just can't come out here and just keep moving your rook. You can't just keep throwing fastballs all the time. After a while, that just becomes like, you know, good hitters will hit that. For sure. For sure. And, and that's how I feel. Um, as long as, as we're, as we're, you know, cause that was the biggest thing when we don't have success, especially this past year, it's, we want to throw a ton of slider, ton of slider, but man, if we're not in the zone and we're not getting ahead, then we're asking for even more trouble because then that fastball it's getting sat on and it's getting hit hard. Yeah. So, so it's, you know, where, where do you, where do you see college guys? Like if, if you had to give me one or two things, where do you see the guys for, for lack of a better term, drop the ball when it comes to helping themselves get an upper hand amongst their peers, almost like what I'm, what I'm trying to say is when you, when you're, coaching new guys and you and you come in what are what are what are some traits you see guys um get themselves into trouble whether it's physically mentally um and you say like oh here goes uh, here goes this scenario again like a common scenario um where guys kind of get in their own way uh, i feel like there's two sides of this there's the on the field baseball side and then there's the overall student athlete side all in, that's to me, it's all encompassing. So just mention, talk about both of those. Yeah. So, um, I mean the student athlete side and the lifestyle side impacts everything. Right. So from that, for me, time management, number one, um, especially new guys that get to campus. And if they're like, that's going to impact everything. If we're up late and we're getting no sleep and depending on the school that you're at, if you're lifting in the morning, lifting in the afternoon, it doesn't matter. But if you're not sleeping, that's a one a that's going to negatively impact everything that you're doing. And then our responsibilities, if we're not going to stay on top of those things and we're not taking care of the schoolwork or the papers or the meetings, academic advisors, stuff like that, tutors, if that stuff is not getting done when it's supposed to be done and it's weighing on us, that's going to impact what we do at the field. Because whether we think so or not, these kids are thinking about that stuff all the time, right? If they're, Oh, I got this paper due tonight. Uh, I, you know, I can't wait to get out of practice because I got to run back to the library so I can finish this by tonight at 9 p.m. Right. Like that stuff happens, whether we hope it doesn't or, you know, it doesn't matter. It, it happens. Right. Um, and then the other side of that, too, is is the nutrition. Like if we're if we're getting out of bed late, we're running to class, we're behind, we're not grabbing something to eat or drink. And then all of a sudden we're trying to get out of class. We're hitting the weight room. We're grabbing something very minimal a protein bar because that's good enough to get us through. Right. And then all of a sudden we're going to practice and we haven't ate much all day. And then we're just going to go slam one big meal after practice and just think that that's going to get it done for us. And that's right. not, um, you a know, lot of times, all of that's a lot of times guys, sorry to interrupt. A lot of times I notice that the guys that are really, really consistent with their workouts, this just stimulates appetite. They generally have better eating habits. The guys that kind of like to try to, hack through lifts and kind of don't like lifting in general. It's a lot easier to skimp on your meals when you're not really training hard. So I, I, I do feel like I noticed that, um, you know, to acclimate guys to eating better, you know, strength training is, is one thing that will make you be starving. So that's a, that's a great thing um, that I can, I can tell you firsthand that I see with guys when, when I need guys to put on weight, I'm like, listen, man, you need to lift because it's going to make you want to eat. Yeah, so. absolutely. And you can't have one without the other, even on the other side, right? right? Because we need, we need to be feeling the bodies. And that's the other thing too. We talked about the throwing volume, just overall volume of what we do every day. Yeah. They're, they're moving. They're all over campus. They're walking, they're lifting, they're at practice. And we know pitchers, as much as we try to eliminate a pitcher is going to be shagging at some point, right? They're on their feet. They're burning so much they're burning so many calories, so much energy throughout the day, every day, especially when we get into 20 hour segments and we're practicing five, six days a week. Um, you know, if they're not, if they're not squared away with their, their routines and they're not refueling their bodies, um, you know, all of that is going to impact what they're trying to do on the field and on the mound. And that's why, you know, at least what I see freshmen struggle so much. And a lot of them see their velo drop that first fall, that first fall get freshmen every year. Yeah. That's, because a that's so one. hard to get used to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, I think and that's it's a why. it's a mechanism. It's it's a it's a combination of the volume 
and not taking care of their bodies. It's it's just they're overwhelmed at that point, you know, and then what they, they have to kind of kick into a groove, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And but that's all part of the process, right? Yep. Like that's every single team in the country goes through that. Every freshman goes through that in the country, um, you know, so hopefully just communication and and older guys on the team and, and putting them under their wing. And hopefully we got a, a good program set up throughout, um, you know, and try to avoid it as much as we can. And, but then get through those, that first semester of finals and, yeah. and the stress that comes with that. And hopefully we can refresh in the winter time and get ready to go. Great. I got one more question for you. Um, what are some, what you consider to be non-negotiables for you to survive at the high, higher levels of collegiate baseball? What are some things that you, you can, recommend to the young athletes getting ready to come in and play division one ball. What are some of the non-negotiables for you? I mean, everybody's probably got different ones. Um, what are some non-negotiables for you as far as on the playing field? For me at the, to be really, really good at the highest level. To me, I think the competitive nature and the goals of what you're trying to get out of this need to be high at least just my opinion. I That's want, I want the guys that do, they do not want to lose. They want to be great. They want to be really, really good. Right. And that attitude and that mentality seems to fix a lot of the issues that we were just talking about. Right. Um, and then at that point, because that, that just leads to so many other different conversations where it's like the guy, what was your bullpen like pregame? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's a bullpen, right? Who are you facing? What's the lineup got? Doesn't really matter. I'm ready to go. I'm going to beat anybody. How's the RPL? RPL is great, right? Oh, what's the wind doing? What's the weather like? Doesn't matter, right? Those guys, those guys, those fierce competitors. They'll endure. Those guys, those guys are one at, um, you know, and then, um, you know, on the field specifically, the multiple pitches and stuff like that, but we need to, we need to be in the zone and we got to be able to compete. Right. Like at the end of the day, the numbers spin, um, pitch design, this stuff matters. Absolutely. It matters. But if it, if it's not in the zone and we're not attacking guys, then that does not matter. 100%. Right. And at the end of the day, if, if we can't at least go one side or the other, right and just go east and west and then maybe show up at times but that's like a minimum right like we need to be able to do that um and to be able to put the ball in play and and force swing decisions and and get some success that needs we need to be in the zone when we want to be talking about talking about a people that a, an athlete that's really just wants to expect themselves to be the best that they can be and it doesn't matter uh Devin Rivera trained here all off, off in the winter and in the summer, that guy comes in. He's the quietest guy. Like he comes in, it almost looks like, how does this guy throw hard? That's like he's just so quiet. But I will tell you this: that guy came in five days a week at the same time. He did whatever we said. He took everything we said to heart. He was so consistent with his training. Um, I mean. It's just – it doesn't even surprise me that he had such a good year. He really, really – he – I have to tell you, just um, – I almost feel like the, the babysitter for these guys when they're not with you. I see them. We train with them. We give them throwing drills. We look at their mechanics. We change their lifting programs based off of what how they're throwing. And I I see these guys for an, an extended period of time. That guy is one of those guys that I see that – does, when when you hear he had a great season, it's not surprising at all. He's consistent. That was what great about him. Yes, he he's very consistent. Um, but the quiet, he yeah, you're one hundred percent right. He's the, one of the quietest kids I, I used to know because he's not like that when we're in the locker room, when we're traveling. See, I never right? see that. I don't see any of that. Yes, it that it it is there for sure. One hundred percent, it is there. Um, especially when he gets going on his teammates and they start going back and forth. Um, yeah, it, it's in there. But the That's first great. time we always, we always joke about this. I tell the story the first time, um, the first time I reached out to him when I took the pitching coach job, he was a senior coming in that first fall and I called him just to introduce myself, whatever. And Hey coach, 
Yep. Yep. Great. Yep. Sounds good. Done. Phone call over. Yeah, and that's I'm, what I'm saying. In my mind, I'm like, oh man, <laughs> oh no. Um, but he's when you really when you see him in that element, um, that's not him. But then you know when he's putting his work in and he's you know whether he's lifting, he's throwing, or even on the mound especially when he does success and he shows emotion coming off of the mound, it really, really shocks you because it just comes out of nowhere and you're not used to seeing it. That probably gets everybody pumped when you see yeah. that. Oh, absolutely. Because you don't ever s- really see it that much. That's great, man. That's a, that's a really yeah. good point to see a guy who's kind of reserved to, to, to just get excited is probably like a, a, a big lift to everybody on the field, you know? Yes. And that, that's him. That's the guy that he is for sure. Awesome. Well, we've we've been talking with Jabin Weaver, pitching coach for Villanova. Uh, Jabin, thanks for being in, and um, it's always great speaking to you. And I'm sure I'll be speaking to you on and off, uh, you know, all summer about your guys. And uh, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. This is this was awesome. Love what you're doing, and yeah, I'm sure how, we'll talk soon. How can uh, how can people reach out to you? I know it's tough. Twitter, Twitter, definitely. Um, at Javen Weaver and then, you know, just the emails and stuff. I check email pretty well. So um, great. And you yeah, can reach just those two. You can reach me at, at Nunzio Signore uh, on Twitter and my facility at RPP underscore baseball on Twitter and Instagram. The website is rocklandpeakperformance.com. I've also got a book out called Velocity Based Training, How to Apply Science, Technology, and Data to Maximize Performance. Uh, it's released by Human Kinetics. You can also get it on Amazon. We've been speaking with Coach Jabin Weaver from Villanova, and uh, we'll see you next time on the next episode of the Behind the Seams podcast. Have a great day.